In this lecture, you'll learn how network load balancing works for NAS protocols. Before I get into how the load balancing works, let's have a quick review of how we're going to set the networking up to support this. So it's recommended to assign one data lift per node, per protocol, per network, per SVM, that enables spreading the overall load out across all your nodes and leverages all the available hardware. If traffic hits a node which does not own the volume that the traffic is for, then that traffic will go over the cluster network. That adds minimal latency and we can handle that. That's not a problem. It's much better to spread all the traffic across all the nodes. The performance gain that we get from that outweighs the minimal amount of latency added for any traffic that goes over the cluster network. So having a look at an example of our network layout here, same example as before, we've got department A and we've got department B. They've both got their SVMs. They had iSCSI set up in the last lecture. In this lecture, they're running NAS as well, again, using the same cluster and the same nodes. So we used VLAN 10 and 20 for iSCSI. We're gonna use different VLANs and different IP addresses for NAS. So this is either NFS or SIFS, it doesn't really matter which one. So our configuration here, we have got for department A, the first lift has got IP address 10.10.30.10, .10 .10, and that is on interface E0A.30, which is a VLAN interface for VLAN 30 traffic that hits the E0A physical port. Then we've got lift two, which is 10.10.30.11 on port E1A.30, 10.10.30.12 on E0A.30 and 10.10.30.13 is homed on E1A.30. So that gives access to our department A volume one on node one and department A volume two on node two. We've also got department B and they've got their department B vol one on node one and their department B vol two on node two. For client access to those volumes, we have configured a department B lift one with IP address 10.10.40.10. .10. Then we've got 40.11, 40.12, and 40.13. They're spread over the physical ports and they are on VLAN 40 interfaces. So we've got VLAN 30 and VLAN 40 and the different IP subnets to keep our department A and our department B traffic separate. Okay, so that is how we have configured the lives, but how are we going to control that the client's incoming connections are gonna be spread across those four available lives? Well, let's have a quick review of SAN again before we get into that. So you know already that SAN protocols use multipath. With SAN, the client learns all the usable IP addresses or WWPNs and makes its own decision on which path or paths to use. So it knows all the IP addresses and it can choose which IP addresses to use. Typically, it's going to use the optimized path and we can use either active, active, active or active standby. But NAS protocols do not have that multipathing intelligence. NAS protocols don't learn all the available IP addresses and make their own choice of which one they're going to use. NAS protocols are going to have knowledge of one IP address only. So they know one IP address and that's the IP address that they are going to connect to. So let's go back a slide again. So we've got those four IP addresses configured for the access, but any one client is going to use just one of those IP addresses and only know that one IP address as well. So we want to spread those incoming client connections across all the available lifts, all those available IP addresses. So how can we do that? Well, we can use off-box DNS load balancing or on-box DNS load balancing or external load balancers. Another way you could do it is you could manually configure a quarter of your clients to use .10, the next quarter of the clients to use .11, and then another quarter to use .12, and the last quarter of the clients to use .13. 
Obviously, that would be super inconvenient, though, of keeping track of how many clients are using which IP address and trying to get an equal split of a quarter on each one. That just would not really be a practical thing to do. We want to have an automated way of telling the clients what IP address to use so we can either use on or off box DNS for that or we could use an external load balancer, for example, from a company like F5. Obviously, configuring external load balancers is outside the scope of this course. To learn how to configure F5, you would do an F5 course, but the off-box and the on-box DNS load balancing is within scope, so let's talk about those now. So first off, off-box round-robin DNS load balancing. When you do this, you're using the company's existing DNS server. So the DNS server, it's already there, already handling all the different DNS requests from the clients. Your clients are going to be sending their DNS requests to that server anyway. And what we do is on that server, we configure address records for each of the logical interfaces. So you can see in the example here, this is for the department A storage for NAS. We've configured an address record for department A underscore storage dot flatbox dot com for the first IP address 10.10.30.10. .10 then we configure another address record with exactly the same name, also department A underscore storage for dot 11, then again the same name for dot 12, and again the same name for dot 13. And now the way that DNS is going to work is the first client request that comes in for department A underscore storage, the DNS server will tell it to use dot 10. The next request that comes in, the DNS server will tell it to use 11. The next one that comes in will use 12. The next one that comes in will use 13. And then the next client request that comes in will be told to use 10 and so on. So this is the standard way that DNS works, that whenever a DNS server has got multiple address records for the same address, it will just round robin load balance between them. It will tell the first client to use the first one, the next client to use the next one, and so on. So the clients connect to the FQDN to access the storage. The FQDN was department A underscore storage dot flatbox dot com. Whenever they go to connect to that FQDN, they'll query the DNS server for the IP address to use. The first client will be told to use 10.10.30.10 and it will go over this path here. The next client will use dot 11. It will go through the other switch and hit the other lift on node one. Those first two, because the volume is owned by node one, then the, the traffic is going to be direct access, meaning it's hitting the node that owns the volume. It will hit the node and then it will go down the SAS cables to the volume. The next client that sends in the DNS request is going to be told to use dot 12 and that terminates on node 2. So this traffic, it does not go over node 2 SAS cables to the volume. Remember, with the connections to the disk shelves, it's always active standby. So node 1's connections are active to the disk shelves, node 2's are not, unless node 1 fails. So on this incoming connection, the incoming connection is going to terminate on node 2, and then the traffic is going to go over the cluster network to get to node 1, and then over its SAS cables again down to the volume. So that was our first three client connections. The next one, the DNS server, will tell it to use 10.10.30.30. That is our last lift, which again hits node two. So again, that traffic will go over the cluster network. And then client five, when it sends in its DNS request, it will be told to use 10.10.30.10. .10, and we're back to the start again. So you see, we're going to just be going round robin through all of the available lifts. And that's going to give us pretty much an even split between the different lifts. That means that all the nodes are going to be getting the traffic. We're spreading the load across all the nodes in the cluster. Okay, so that was off-box DNS load balancing. Next up, let's talk about on-box DNS load balancing. So off-box means that you're, you, the NetApp system is using an external DNS server, the normal one that's in the company. With on-box DNS load balancing, the DNS is actually going to be done by the NetApp ONTAP cluster as well. So here, the company's existing DNS server is configured to forward requests for the storage FQDN to the storage system. So when we're doing the off-box DNS load balancing, 
the client sent in a DNS request for department A underscore storage dot flatbox dot com to the company DNS server, and then the DNS server replied directly back to the client. When we use on-box DNS load balancing, on the other hand, the client still sends the DNS request to its DNS server as normal, but then that DNS server forwards request onto the NetApp system, and it can give a better answer than off-box DNS could on its own, because the cluster will respond with the IP address of the LIF, which is under the lowest current load. So let's see how that's different. Let's just go back here again. And I'll go back to client one. And you saw that with the normal off box round robin DNS load balancing, the first client gets directed to dot 10, the next one's dot 11, the next one's dot 12, the next one's dot 13, and then back to dot 10 again. And at first glance, this looks like it's going to give you an exactly equal 25% split on each of the lifts. But what can actually happen is, by coincidence, the clients that are connected to node 1 have got shorter session times than the clients that are connected to node 2. And then if that happens, node 2 is actually going to be doing more work. So with the off-box load balancing, honestly, it is going to be a pretty even split, but it's not going to be exact. So if you do want to get that better split, where it's actually the least loaded node that's always getting the new connection, then you can use the on-box load balancing for that. You can also assign weights to your lifts as well if you're doing the on-box load balancing. So if you've got different models of node in your cluster, you could have the newer, more powerful nodes doing more of the work. Also, on-box DNS load balancing takes the current load on the lifts into account when balancing the new connections. So that's what I was explaining there about with the off-box. It's just simple round robin. It doesn't take into account the load on the lifts, but the on-box does. So on-box is better, but to be honest, it doesn't make like a huge amount of difference. So out in the field, you'll still see a lot of people using the off-box load balancing as well. Thanks for watching. If you want to get hands-on practice with NetApp Storage for free on your laptop, then you can download my free ebook, which you can see above my head right now. Also, check out my NetApp Storage Complete course, which will teach you everything you could possibly want to know about ONTAP. Thanks.